Hello, Dr. Mike here, and this is a quick lecture video on encryption, So, which is uh, chapter 15 out of the book for CompTIA Security Plus Certification Guide, uh, first edition. Information for the book is located in the course shell, um, and I will link, link to a previous video. If I put a tag up here on um, the previous textbooks, lecture with slides, in case you want to go back and view that one. But we're going to cover what the chapter covers, and I'll add some, of course, some stuff in there that's not in the textbook I think it's important to talk about. So, uh, first off, cryptography in general, um, history of. It's nothing new, um, and the chapter talks about, you can see here, uh, seizure cipher, for example. Um, you go back in time, and if you look at the wiki pages for a lot of this stuff, you'll see some examples here of ancient Greek style of cipher here. Uh, they would write their message across this way, but you need to know the diameter and the length and the wrapping um, to be able to unravel this. And so you write your text this direction. And so of course it would be somewhat, somewhat um, uh, you know, encrypted. Uh, encryption basically scrambled. Um, or unbeknownst, unless you have some sort of key. Now, we, of course, we know cryptography today um, with uh, encryption, digital encryption, but it, there's a lot of places where it came into play really early on. So again, the textbook talks about substitution cipher, Caesar cipher, um, substitution cipher, almost real, real easy. Uh, you can shift the library, shift your alphabet over by a certain number. So in this case, um, A, N is equal to A now. And knowing this number here, you can go ahead and basically encrypt your data. Now, of course, uh, with today's technology, it's easy. You can find online sites that actually crack this pretty easily. Um, it'll just go through and, and try all different combinations and show you the output so you can almost, the human eye can tell, well, yeah, that's a sentence and that's not. So, uh, but substitution ciphers, I know those ciphers have been around for a while. Um, and cryptography itself, again, um, got a great history on it. Uh, textbook has a little bit about it here. Um, again, to, you know, take a look at it. It's definitely some, some pretty good stuff. And now part of this also is uh, stenography. So this is sort of a small branch off of encryption. The basis being the best way to help protect something is to hide it in plain sight. That's really what it is. It's hiding things in plain sight. Again, this is not new to digital. Um, examples here, red, green, blue, different different uh, eyeglass, and different uh, lens to see a different coloration through. Um, and of course, there's a lot of stuff here about physical World War II, about the uh, dots, um, Morse code on yarn and, and, and yarn. But digital, of course, we know and we probably, I think we tackle in this course, we look at stenography, uh, hiding something inside an image, for example. Definitely something that, that there. And that is just part of it. Um, it's more of like craft work type stuff. Uh, you wouldn't want to use this in the sense of security plus, <laughs> where you're talking about uh, securing um, your corporation or your business or even yourself. I don't think I would want to rely upon stenography to hide my master password list for my password manager, for example. Just being aware though, it is sort of an offshoot of this, um, and it's a pretty fascinating read. It's always interesting to look at. So, um, so take a look here at, at the chapter itself. Um, it talks about things like one-time pads. Pretty straightforward. Um, if you can create a very strong random key and use it um, to encrypt some text. We'll call this, this is our plain text. And then we have a one-time key or a one-time pad, it's usually referred to. And we have our encrypted text. So we'll call this our e-text. Um, talk, talk about this basically. This, is, this can be very strong, uh, especially if this is destroyed somehow or and then, and then you get to figure this out without knowing this. Um, it says unbreakable, but that's always a, uh, I would, would be careful calling anything unbreakable. <laughs> um, 
but it is basic a standard for basic cryptography um, now this is going to depend upon a lot of things I'm going to talk about randomness in a little bit a uh, very important aspect here and that's actually a big part of this and it's part of uh, this here this is actually a huge part is the key itself so whether we do a one-time pad asymmetric cryptography symmetric cryptography we'll talk about these in a second um, the key strength is really the cornerstone of it um, no, you know, no surprise if I create a key that's called key <laughs> or password for example or something really weak that could be guessed and with of course today's technology you can uh, brute force dictionary attack there's a lot of ways to randomly guess and try to force certain keys um, if this is weak then this is going to be weak so keep that in mind it's very important and we're going to talk about randomness in a second here let's also talk about cryptography also uh, before we walk and walk and talk about hashing for example um, as it refers to CIA so confidentiality integrity and availability so remember this is our cornerstone back from our previous lecture uh, the three sort of tenets of security uh, so confidentiality pretty straightforward um, you know, I create a, a uh, strong key that I know and maybe I give to one other person and now that information we encrypt is confidential um, so pretty straightforward there uh, cryptography really it fits the C <laughs> cryptography really fills that perfectly um, integrity now how can we use it for integrity so that's what the chapter comes in we talk about look at hashing functions so a common use of a hash you might see um, yourself here is uh, like if I go download something so let's say I go here, this, this is website here, this is Cali, the Cali.org website, and here we see the 2021 change log. I want to download um, either the torrent or direct download, uh, pretty big download, this is 4.3 gigabytes here. I, mean, I want to download the installer. So I want to be sure that when I, what I that 4.3 gigabytes um, is intact, there was no um, issues with transmission, um, transmission issues. Uh, right into disk issues, anything like that. I want to make sure that what I have downloaded is is complete before I install it. I don't want to start an installation of anything. Uh, you know, you know, I spend maybe so much time downloading this 4.3 gigabytes, then I go through the process, start installing it, and figure out there's an error. So something to check for is uh, you'll see here they give you something called the sum. I don't want to start this now. <laughs> um, they use this SHA256 sum. So SHA, so secure um, digest, basically secure hashing algorithm, or message digest, as referred to. Uh, it is a process, and I'm not going to go into the, the mathematics of it, how it does it, but it creates a fixed length output based on an input that is unique. Uh, so if any changes at all were made to this 4.3 gigabytes, it could be one bit to be off. Um, this will not match and this is not anything that matches where the beginning of the file is here and the end of the file is here it doesn't match with that the length itself is 256 bits for the, for the SHA for example uh, and there's other ones there's 512, 256, you don't see 384 too much um, SHA1 pretty common 160 bits uh, MD5 is another one um, real common 128 bit now you won't use you don't want to use these, for example, to protect your passwords because you can. Um, some of these can be reversed, so this is not really coming with confidentiality, but it is coming with integrity. So an SHA here or um, MD5 allows us to look for changes. Now let's look at an example here. Um, so you can see. And it's Kali Linux here. I have two documents, one in documents, one in my current folder, both called hash.txt, both the same um, date time and both the same length, 125 bits. So, can we assume they're the same? Um, and this is where there are ways uh, to make minor changes to a file and not affect the file size. And of course, I, I purposely use the touch command, I force both these at the same date time. So I could fool somebody and say, well, it's the same date time, has been changed. Um, so I can run this through MD5 sum. So I'm gonna run MD5 sum command. 
on hash.txt. And this is just a little scripting thing here with the add at sign. That is the, uh, it's a bash, it's a shell function saying if this works, then run this. So it's a nice way to go and chain together two, two commands at one time. So that's what the add at means. So if this works, which it should, md5sum hash.txt, then md5sum the documents hash.txt. So if I run that, we can see they do not match. Uh, so, wow. So now these are not very big documents. Um, if I cat out hash.txt and I cat out um, documents hash.txt, um, these are really small. So I'm right off the bat, um, run the first line, I can see this, this E has been changed to a three. Um, we can also use diff, and there's a lot of tools that look for differences. I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to get into the Linux part of the lecture. Uh, I would made this example just for real easy. But imagine this file was several thousand pages long of hash text. And yeah, I can look for a diff, but the important thing is though, um, I can say, well, these don't match. This is the one you gave me. This is the one I have in my documents. Why is it different? So, and this allows for integrity. So very important we, we look at that here, and this allows for the integrity, if I can verify the integrity of that. So this is used extensively, um, very extensively in um, forensics work. So especially criminal forensics, but even in forensics, um, uh, for corporate forensics, you know, and a lot of times it's used to preserve evidence. So, uh, and I'll just give you a quick example of that here. We're gonna talk about forensics later in the course, but it's used mainly just to get a, a read-only copy of the, um, of the suspect's phone, let's say. Uh, so I get a total copy of their phone, a total device copy. I do that over a you know, like read-only network, and I get a hash of that. And then I'm gonna make a copy of that again, and I hash it again. I can show that um, the copy I'm working from is an exact copy of the one that's taken from the device. So. Uh, help prove it and make sure nothing was changed. So there's no uh, tainting of evidence, for for example. So hash analograms help with that. Uh, we're going to talk about confidentiality a little more here with just cryptography and key management, but availability. So how does this fit with availability? And you think, well, it doesn't only really fit, does it? How can we use availability as part of encryption? Well, there is a way, and I'll use HIPAA, for example. HIPAA being, um, we need to be sure that this database is available to any um, the database, this patient's file or patient files database needs to be available to any doctor who has the authorization um, to read it. Now, I just, uh, if I lock, if I use cryptography here and integrity, so for one, I can ensure the, the records um, have not been modified. I keep a database of changes, auditing who's logged in when. Uh, the, M the SHA of the record, uh, or maybe a tuple of the records, uh, the record of the change, and the new SHA. So we have a, a basically almost, um, you know, a, a, a chain of changes that have been uh, recorded. So, um, so integrity can be used for that, but also encryption here. We use encryption, so this database is open to the world because we know it's encrypted. So we have the database of records. Uh, we use encryption, and we use, we use of course, we use authentication um, and, and authorization. Um, so A and A, we do an A and A on it. Authorization and uh, authentication and authorization. So first off, the doctor can prove who they say they are, and then we say, yes, you do have access to that. Here's the key to it, and now it's available. So being able to protect it allows us to put it in public. So that's just what, that's how sort of availability plays. I know availability really comes from you think, uh, and you'll see this later in the course, things like backups, um, high availability systems, things like that. That is, yeah, that is really where availability comes into play, but it does play with encryption. Encryption does help support the availability of that. I mean, meaning that anyone can get to that database who has authorization to, so. Anyways, let's talk about key management. So first off, um, symmetric encryption, I shouldn't close that. Um, Symmetric encryption is pretty straightforward. Uh, I create one key. You can see here in this example, we create a secret key. Now, I know somebody can talk about key management here. Uh, before we get into key management, like how keys are generated is a very important aspect of this. So, um, there's something called a nonce. 
um, number used once. O N C E yeah, O N C E a uh, nonce number number once number used once. Um, this nonce is created uh, usually by some sort of device, a trusted platform module, um, which is going to be a chipset um, on your device. Uh, we have this on our mobile devices. Uh, there's usually a chipset that's a security-only chipset um, for Apple and Android devices, and uh, these will help create truly random numbers, a random blob, it's usually called. We have a blob of randomness. Created once, we take a slice of that, and we have what we call our knots. From this knots, we create a set length of key. Maybe we, it's a 512-bit, uh, which is pretty, little, I'm pretty short actually, um, or 1024-bit, or 2048. You know, we want to probably a nice large key, 2048. And you can probably guess the larger the key, the stronger it is. Now, this nonce can be seated in some fashion. It, uh, it could be everything from your mouse movement. Uh, a lot of times we're just recording your mouse movements. Uh, randomness from that. Um, randomness from a chipset uses uh, like a spillover diode. Um, and there's a ton of stuff on randomness on ram.org. So ram.org is fantastic. Um, there's stuff here about the history of introduction of randomness, um, pseudo random number generators to two random number generators, and things like atmospheric storms, atmospheric gen um, uh, randomness from atmospheric noise, um, quantum events. <laughs> so, and the thing is, how, why, why is this so important? So, think about computers. Uh, they're not random. They're very set. We have a, you know, a, a fetch, execute, decode cycle is set uh, to run on a certain amount of megahertz, right, or gigahertz per se. Very, very set. You know, set, execute, decode, uh, our code itself. Do this, do this, do this, right? Very orderly, either functional, even functional, even um, object oriented. It's still very functional based. Uh, everything's set in stone, right? We want to, we want our computers to work solidly in a certain way. Well, how do you introduce randomness out of that? How do you get something random out of something that's not random? So that's where this trusted platform module comes in, this chipset. Um, it can be fed externally. There's a great video um, from, uh, not FireEye, I think it is. Uh, not FireEye, but um, if I do, I'll link it. It's a great video about the use of lava lamps uh, to create randomness. <laughs> so uh, it's definitely worth watching. It sounds crazy. Um, Everything from the video, the cameras recording the lava lamps, you know, you know, um, errors in the recording, which cause you know bits to be different. Um, you know, there's so much to take into play. The more random it is, the better it is. So, and there's checks for this. And you think, well, what is this used for, right? Is this used for only keys? Well, it's not. Um, we also use this for things like session IDs. And um, if a session ID is not truly random. If I can guess it, I might be able to guess a, a user's session ID and, and, and then latch onto their session. So it can be used in a lot of different areas and not just with encryption itself. So fascinating stuff here on random.org, in case you're curious. Definitely look at it. Um, introduction of randomness. Cisco um, tests for it. But it's also it's a great site just to go to in case you're like, hey, I'm doing a game. <laughs> I, I need a free. Uh, I need a. Free, you know. I'm, let's say I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna pick the first ten thousand people who subscribe to my to my channel. I'm gonna pick one and by random. Well, how do you, how am I doing that? I know it's not random. Well, in this case, you know, I'm using this. And how can I prove it's random? I can say, well, I'm using random.org, and this is how they they create the randomness. So, but um, it's used for games a lot. And then with games. Um, yeah, the, you know, randomness can be done programmatically. That's where that pseudo random number generator comes in. Pseudo random means there's some software that's sort of creating some randomness. And for things like again, like a game, maybe I'm rolling a d20, you know, <laughs> um, and maybe we're doing random loot generation on an online game. Um, you don't need to go through all this fuss. But when it comes to encryption, that key strength and the randomness that it comes from this nonce that's created and this this sort of bland, this blob of randomness that, that is created from either a platform module or some other type of source 
is very critical. All right, so I got too much here. So let's talk about um, encryption types. So uh, symmetric encryption, uh, fantastic. I mean, it's basically straightforward. I create a key. I have some plain text. I use the key to encrypt it with some sort of algorithm. Uh, I create ciphertext. I share that ciphertext with somebody. I got to share the key with it. So if red and blue here are the only two people need it, that works fine. It's very strong. Um, now, but key management can be the issue here. And chapter talks about key management. Um, so key management itself, what's that, what does that mean by key management? Well, uh, it doesn't scale well. So again, if I create uh, a secret key, and I use it, uh, that key, uh, secret key one here, call it SK1, I create it, it's me, I share it with user number one. That's fine. We can keep record of it. We can make, create some sort of way to do key management. Maybe we have a special server with a file that only has authentication for user one. Um, maybe in the file itself, um, it's you know, password protected or whatever, or it's locked down to where only, only a user who has ownership of that file can view it, right? Either the Windows or Linux. But um, what if I need to share this uh, encrypted text I create with this, this cipher text with another user? User two, or with a class. Maybe I need to create a secret thing. I need to share with a class of what, 20 people? So dot, 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 20, right? This secret key now is gonna be have more chance of being leaked. With 20 people, um, secret key can become an issue. <laughs> so key management, do I create a key for each user? And so I gotta, I gotta encrypt the thing with each key once and then mail that user the key. So now you can see it does not scale well at all. Um, there are some ways where keys are sort of managed. Um, a lot of it is I take a key and I break it into chunks and there's ways where you can take the key and share it with only certain people. Um, only, maybe only certain servers have chunks of the key. And of course you want more than one server. Maybe this server, there's two servers. Um, this server is this one and this one. So there's some multiple on one server. And to fetch the entire key here, I need to be able to access each of these servers or their backups. And then we'll get each, each, each chunk of the key. So the idea being uh, not only you have to hack, <laughs> you would have to hack all the servers, just know where they are first. Um, and of course, to get to those servers, you have authentication in play, maybe multi-factor authentication. And so to create the, the key, a copy of the key, I would need to be able to access these boxes. So. Um, again, it, a single key management, it's just, there's a lot of issues with it. So here we can talk about TPM in the, in the uh, textbook, it talks about it here. Um, so again, um, algorithms, I'm going to come back to algorithms in a second. Um, we're going to talk about the other one, though, asymmetric encryption. So going on that issue of how come I cannot create, it, I cannot create a million keys. Now let's get to the looking at things like HTTPS. Um, this is such a huge deal, right? Uh, for everyone who logs into, my, logs into my bank, let's say, I run a bank, I need to create a key session, uh, a, a strong session, just for the login. Uh, login session itself, LS, has a key generated just for that session. And then during that generation, we create a session key. This key is only used once and discarded. And then we use the session key and we access our bank data. I'll put a really bad drawing of a database here. <laughs> so um, when this is done, this key is also destroyed. This is only for one user. So create this for, you know, one, two, n users. So I need to be able to create blobs of random data, splice off keys using a certain algorithm, and I'm gonna talk about algorithms in a second, and I need to issue those keys out. So again, it's not gonna scale well. Um, so we have something called asymmetric encryption, and it's having a key pair, public-private key, and we have two keys are generated. So we have a 
private key and a public key. The private key um, is used to encrypt it, but the public key can de-encrypt it. So the biggest uh, one that you see this is right here, it's RSA. RSA really, when this came in, into uh, play, the RSA, which and this is um, the initials of the three individuals who created this, uh, that really took off. This allowed for TLS, SSH, and of course HTTPS with Diffie-Hellman key exchange, uh, which is sort of Diffie-Hellman is the way how we exchange keys securely. RSA is the way we create the keys. Those two are really the cornerstone of allowed for HTTPS or online shopping, online banking, really took off here. So uh, look at RSA, look at, it's uh, definitely important to understand this. Um, think of it this way. Another way to look at this is instead of um, creating another key, I'm sort of really giving you the lock. And it sounds funny. So I have a key. I'm going to draw a key here. This is my private key. You want to send me something only I can read. Well, instead of doing this whole key generation, uh, you know, a key for each student, for example, uh, and key management, I create a public-private pair. And so this way is here. And the public key, private key, of course, PK is private set. I keep it locked behind, uh, you know, my own server and everything. Uh, but availability of a public key. Here we have a public key. Think of this as almost an open lock. Really, it's more of a lock. So you you have a message you want to give me. You want to encrypt it. Well, instead of going through the hassle of creating a uh, you know a, a symmetrical key for this one that was one use, I have a public key. You've got the public key. Take that message and you're sort of locking it, locking that message with the key. But only way you can unlock it is with the private key. Only the private key can unlock the message. So I know we look at key pairs and they are, and it is a key, they are keys and they're based off, um, really off factoring, basic factoring and um, prime numbers. I'm not gonna get into the math of it, uh, maybe uh, if I do in class stuff, we'll get into it, but uh, keeping it light, think of this way. Now I can extract that text file. So public private key, I got a key. The public key is sort of like an open lock. You, everyone can have a copy of it. It's out there. You grab it, you encrypt the message, you give it to me. But as soon as it's encrypted with that public key, only I can unencrypt it with the private key. So this, this ability to create public private key pairs um, this scales well because I might, I might be able to have maybe you know a few sets of, of private keys uh, for different uses. Maybe one for admin users, one for public users, and one for my um, internal only. And from there, I can create a huge. Uh, well, I see basically a public key for each one. That public key for each one um, scales great because I see one. This goes to one to end with no issue. Now again, you know, I did be able to deliver it, so there, of course there's um, you know load on the system, deliver the public key, um, but I can manage it. I can with integrity checking. I can ensure integrity. Diffie Hellman helps me do this. It's a way to exchange keys using secure cycle layers. So there's ways with Diffie Hellman, and, and we'll talk about later, which, which is PKI. This is a different chapter and different um, lecture. I can ensure that this public key that you're giving me, I can ensure that it's been certified from me. So, um, and that's what we like at certificates. We see that within web browsers. Yeah, let me digress here. That's a different different topic we're gonna cover. That's a different chapter. But you can see how it bleeds into that. Um, there's ways for me to uh, deliver, ensure, ensure integrity and security, but I can deliver this key, public key, with no issue. There's no regeneration of, of constant generations of nonces and keys, and this allows, um, this is the basic of RSA, RSA allows this ability to really deliver, um, deliver that. And of course, creation of the keys can be heavy on CPUs. Now, back in the day, uh, key generation was a big issue on CPU load, so things like uh, uh, elliptical curve cryptography came in. 
Um, it uses a little different way of three numbers on a curve. That's why it's called curve photography. Um, uses special three points based on an input. The input creates a curve, the three points are taken out, and those three points generate <clears throat> our key values we need to do key generation. Um, Talked about stronger already. ready. Talked about CIA. Um, and of course, other words we see key generation used uh, is dig digital signatures. And again, this is bleeding over into PKI, which I'm not going to go into uh, in this here. But the chapter is brief to talk about it. Um, again, hashing we use for this um, email, for example, TrueCrypt. And there's ways you can employ cryptography to ensure um, it's being used correctly. Now, how do we do that? Let's talk about some resources here. So ram.org is fantastic. NIST. <laughs> so again, um, you're given a role as a cybersecurity engineer. First task you're given is, okay, you know, how do we ensure that our databases are being secure? Yeah, so we're employing cryptography at rest. There's cryptography, of course, for data and transit, and cryptography for processing. Um, or you want to apply cryptography in those areas. Um, we're going to look at uh, data at rest, our database management. How do we know that we're doing it? Or maybe uh, cryptography for our transmission of data. How can we ensure we're using it correctly? That's a pretty big question. How do you ensure that? Well, you want to make sure you're using the, the, most approved, the, the best approved um, standards, and then we have NIST for that. So the NIST has cryptographic standards and guidelines. Then for all areas, hash functions, key management, uh, post quantum cryptography, random bit generation, ah, that's a good one, randomness. Um, how do we ensure we're getting proper randomness? And here we have, of course, back to those SP, special um, our SP documents. Special Publication 890-A, Recommendation for Random Number Generation Using Deterministic Bit Generators. So this is really like how we sure for random bit generators. I mean, you can really go down and um, get the best procedure for, um, for the task you need. And again, this is going to make... Uh, does it make you and your company or your institution look good because you're not rolling your own cryptography? Can't say this as much. You don't want to come in as a security engineer or uh, you know, any, any kind of maybe security auditor or either external or internal and say, yeah, we do our own cryptography. That's bad. <laughs> that's a big no-no. You don't, um, if you're playing a game, that's fine. You make your own random number generator, that's fine. If it's for a game, you know, that, that's usually okay. There's no need to go into this level of depth. But if you talk about cybersecurity or encryption, you do not roll your own cryptography. Cryptography goes back to mathematics and it gets um, proofed and it gets you know, poured over by mathematicians for a long time before it gets approved. That's what NIST helps do. Helps ensure that um, there are these in certain algorithms that are approved, and that's what the chapter talks about here, is um, uh, like are you using um, AES, for example? What size AES are you using? RC4, are you using Blowfish? Um, these algorithms, uh, RSA, Dippy Hellman, for example, um, you know, are you using the most approved ones? And this is where this comes into play. And so, you know, how's it, I'm not gonna get into the details of the document here, but for example, key management. Um, I need to follow some key management guidelines for applications, so so there's a NIST 857 Part 3. Look at this. I even go to that, and it gives me a nice little abstract here. So I can give this these links to a higher level um, manager and say this is what we're using. And you're, great, this looks good because you're using the most up approved. In this case, we can say okay. Uh, I need to do a cipher suite for my email. How can we do um, S mine? What's the best way to protect our emails? And you say, well, okay, well, let's make sure the email system in the configuration has got um, uh, FIPS 180-4 approved SSH-256. So FIPS is the other area, too. The FIPS, um, I'm not clicking that yet. <laughs> the uh, FIPS 180-4 is sort of the federally uh, approved. This is what we should be using. Um, so I use an AES-128 in CBC mode. So now I can relate 
a best practice back to a configuration in my system. If it doesn't have it, what does it have? What it has, is that listed anywhere? Is it, is it, is it listed as a not, not to use? Is it, is it a deprecated or um, aged out? So let's say example, we say, yeah, we use MD5 for our password generation. Well, that's definitely not, <laughs> that's a, if you go, I'm like a dig into it, but you dig into the uh, NIST standards about passwords right, and also some other best practices we can use for passwords too. Um, you know, it's gonna be, you know, easy to say, yeah, that's something to use. We need to get new software. Um, another one too is, um, a big one is OWASP. Um, I'm going to introduce you to OWASP. Now, i probably introduce this later when we talk about, um, especially the top 10, we look at actual um, web app issues, but OWASP has um, sort of cheat sheets. So let's go and just do a search for OWASP cheat sheets. Cheat sheets. There we go. So OWASP cheat sheets are great because again, maybe you're working with a development team and like, so, all right, you know, cybersecurity engineer, what are we going to do to make sure that our app, our database, our transmission of data, whatever is, is done correctly? What can, how can you help me? How can I make sure I'm doing it correctly? And you can start talking about NIST and stuff and they're going to be like, snooze, I'm busy. I need, I need to get, um, you know, I need to get, yeah, I know I'm not going to read the FIPS 140 guideline, I'm sorry, for which is security crunch of cryptographic modules. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through all this. I need you to just tell me what do I need to do for my database. Well, cheat sheets, here we go, Ajax security, database security. Bam. SQL injection prevention sheet. Now, I'm not getting into that, that's a way different topic. But we can ensure that we're using proper transmit layer protection. I'm using TLS 1.2 plus, you know. Um, we don't play what kind of authentication we're using. This is a great sheet to go through and say for Microsoft SQL Server, consider the use of Windows integrated authentication. So right here, and then let's say we're working with a uh, Microsoft SQL SQL Server developer. They go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And so there's a link there to it. All right, cool. Oh, yeah, and they go, oh yeah, yeah, we do use that. Boom. So now I give them something to a team member who's not to talk security. They talk database. I give them something that's real easy to read. It's quick to look over and then go, are we using native authentication plugins? I don't know, we're not. Okay, well, maybe we should explore that. And voila, now you've sort of given them uh, sort of a heads up on the best practices. And these are usually um, based off best practices from NIST uh, or FIPS, things like that. Microsoft will be ensured that they have the latest and greatest uh, using the, the best algorithms. And that could include um, Diffie Hellman, it could include you know, using um, a strong AES, um, 3DES, for example, um, things like that. So, block ciphers, you know, stream ciphers, and things like that. So, again, uh, there's checklists here you can use, uh, you know, Docker, and so on. So, these are fantastic. These cheat sheets are great. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to look at this again in other lectures. Um, so introduced to you OWASP, and OWASP cheat sheets is probably the biggest thing, but OWASP Foundation is um, Open Web Application Security Project. Definitely going to tell me these guys when we talk about uh, injection and cross-site scripting and some other stuff, but they have these cheat sheets, and these are the, the prime thing you can use to sort of lift yourself out of the hole of trying to explain a, you know, SP-857 to somebody, and you're like, bored? <laughs> Just tell me what I need to do in my database. Okay, use this, use this. All right, I can do that. So in any case, <laughs> so that's just some examples here um, for key management. Uh, a couple things here, um, block ciphers I didn't talk about. Uh, block ciphers and stream ciphers, pretty straightforward. Uh, a block cipher is I have the text I want to encrypt I'm just gonna take that. I'm gonna encrypt a block at a time using some sort of encryption algorithm. And I'll encrypt that block. And something like 3DES actually will take that and it will use that encryption algorithm 
on a second round, e8-2, and it'll take it and do it again, each one having a separate key. So three key, uh, or three DES, for example, that's block. Stream Cipher is just that. It's taken this text and centered it out, let's see, starting here and ending here, and streaming out every single bit or every single series of bits through a cipher and basically encrypting it as you stream through it. So it comes in, here's my, um, here's my, my encryption algorithm. It comes in plain text. It gets these changes for the algorithm. It could be something called XORing, for example. Um, an XOR table maybe applied to it. And it's going to change parts of this, and when I get out of it, it's my encrypted text. So stream, stream ciphers are two of them. Some call a sponge cipher. It's sort of a hybrid. It's taking a, a chunk of this and running it through a stream. So you might see the word sponge cipher, but the two common ones are um, block ciphers and stream ciphers. So, so those are two that you'll see. Uh, and it talks about it here. Um, data stream, it talks about it in the textbook, so I just want to reiterate it. It's a pretty important aspect there. So, database security, OWASP, best practice cheat sheets, um, NIST, great resource to go back to and see, you know, um, what is the best to use. And there is also FIPS, and there should be a link to that in, um, I think, in the course material. And above all, you can see how this relates back to the CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. All right, so this ends uh, this chapter. I hope this is helpful. Thanks for watching.